My name's Liz Chatterton. I'm a watercolour artist based in Berkshire. Every week I share a tip or trick that I wish I'd known about ages ago. I also really like looking for new and unusual watercolour supplies and looking for ones that are a bit of a bargain. A few months ago I decided to review Rosa Watercolours because I know that a number of people are looking to support Ukraine and they are a Ukrainian brand had heard that they were quite different from their pan formulations. So when I had the chance to try out some of Rosa pans, I jumped at it. As you can see from the state of this little tin, I have been using them. I'm excited to get this lovely little set of Rosa Gallery pans. And thank you very much to Painters Online for sending them to me. So let's first of all get into the packaging and what I'm going to do is go through swatch them out and see what I think to them. A while ago I did a review of the, uh, the, the Rosa tube watercolours and I found my swatch sheet so it'll be interesting to compare the, the tubes to the pans. Here's the little set. This is the sort of classic watercolour set. They're full pans and there's 12 in there and I've got an extra burnt sienna because I don't think you can actually paint anything without burnt sienna. It's my favourite. So I've got 13 to try. They do give you a little swatch card, which is fine, but I've, I've set it out here with the information. I've put these lines so that we can judge the opacity of the colours. We'll do some lifting out and, and see what we think. Let's just have a quick look at what they say. So there are 70 colours in the range. This is their artist quality range, whereas Rosa Studio is their student quality. They're made in the Ukraine. They're made with organic gum arabic and they say they have a high ratio of pigment. They're 2.5 mil the pans. They say they develop them in collaboration with artists. This set from Painters Online would be £25.19 and the individual pans are £3.50 so that gives you an idea of the price point. It has got all the pigment numbers whether they're transparent, it's got light fastness rating and also whether they granulate, that's the G, and whether they contain natural pigment which is the N. Right, we'll keep that to hand. Let's get into the pans. So when you're taking the papers off, I personally would leave the ends on if I were you, just in case all these fell out of the tin and you're looking at them and can't remember which is which or you want to reorder something like that. Mm -hmm. Moment of truth, let's grab these colours and see what we reckon. We'll have a look, see how they wet and how they thin down across the paper and get that first impression. This is a cotton paper from Meaden that I'm working on just to swatch them out. So that's cadmium red, yellow light, PY35, and this is cadmium lemon, also. E35, but you can see that it's a far cooler lemon and it's a, a lemon yellow there. Just trying to get a nice pale tint at the end. Now, Madder, oh, sorry, I should have said that cadmium red light is PR108 and PO20 and then we've got this madder red instead of say an alizarin which you might expect to see and I imagine that is because of the light fastness issues that you get with alizarin so that's PR177 and PR264 rather a nice colour so here's the PG Eight, which they just call green because you run out of D 
descriptions on the day they named that. Rather a nice green there. And then we've got the emerald green, which is the PG7. Cobalt blue. I am noticing that the, the pans are releasing the colour really nicely. Uh, certainly no scrubbing to get that colour off and that's rather lovely. The information does tell you that they expect the cobalt blue to granulate as they do with the ultramarine here, PB29. And actually talking of granulations, they said the cadmium red light should granulate too, which will be interesting to see. The yellow ochre is PY43 and PY42. So these are a natural pigment. If they've got N by them, it's a natural pigment. And then we have the umber. PBR7, which isn't necessarily quite as dark as I was expecting it to be. That doesn't look as rich as I might expect. Let's give it a bit more oomph. It's a natural pigment. Such a mucky worker. Look at this. Trying so hard. Right, sepia, which is a three pigment mix. We have got PBR7, PBK7 and PR177 and that's a rather nice rich brown just compared to that umber if you look at that sort of difference and then interestingly the black rather than being Mars black or ivory black this, they call this neutral black and again that's a three pigment mix and I'll be interested uh, to see what it's like as we thin it out so that's got some a blue PB15 then PBK7 and then PR177 that's interesting because I'm seeing a lot of blue come through in that. It's rather nice as it thins out. And that looks to me like it's going to granulate, though I don't think... Let me have a quick look. No, they don't say that it's a granulating colour. And then let's check my burnt sienna. See what we think to that. Oh gosh, that's a very vibrant orange. It's a PR101. Really don't worry about memorizing all these different pigments. I I personally don't. I mean some some I know, you know, like PB29 for ultramarine. But others I have to look up and I don't try and remember them all. If that's your thing, that, that's great. But what the pigment numbers help you to do is compare formulations across different manufacturers so that you can work out what's going on. Just to illustrate that, so these are some Michael Harding watercolours I recently tested. And you can see, I know this is wet and this is dry, so I should be comparing like with like. But... The burnt sienna is a PR101, that's a burnt sienna PR101, and they appear to be quite different colours. The cadmium red, this is a true cadmium red as PR108, whereas we saw that was PR108 but with PO20 in it. It's just useful for that comparison. Some people are really into their pigment numbers and the chemistry of their paints, which is fantastic. But don't feel that you have to. We'll let those dry and we'll try and see how much of a colour shift there is. Yeah, so our colours always dry a little bit lighter, but how much lighter is, is interesting to see. Some you just sort of seem to disappear. So come back when we've done that, reach some conclusions. I don't 
think we've had a huge colour shift. It's always hard to remember, isn't it? So when I look back at the film, I'll be able to tell whether we have or haven't, but I don't think we have. And that is good because there is nothing more annoying than coming back and suddenly half your work's disappeared. The final thing I like to do is to check whether things are staining or not. And how I do that is get a stiff, short, flat brush, make sure it's, it's clean and damp, and I rub it backwards and forwards across and then lift out any pigment that I have loosened. And here you can see very little of that cadmium yellow light lifted, which does surprise me a bit. Given this is the same pigment, I'm not expecting a lot of this to go. And no, that isn't. Now, some of the lifting properties will be down to the pigment and some will be down to the paper. And why it's important to you might be wondering. Well, the first reason is say you want to adjust your work, you've gone too dark or you want, you've lost a highlight. You know, how easy is it to lift the paint for sort of corrections or for artistic reasons? Equally well, how staining the paint is, is important for, for glazing. So we might want to layer and layer and layer our watercolours and we don't want the bottom layer to lift easily while well, a staining colour as a base layer is going to stay is going to stay put so understanding how your pigments work is just really important very few watercolour pigments lift incredibly easily sorry to say but some lift more easily than others. And looking at these, very few of them lift easily at all. It's not just about the contrast, because I've, I've done it against a, the, the dark part of the paint. It's about what's left in the paper, how much of a tint. And you can see, I would absolutely expect something like that madder red to, to stain, but the cadmium stains a lot more than I anticipated. And look at this neutral black. I would imagine it's because it's got PB15 in, which is thalo blue, and that's a notorious staining colour. I mean, it's like nuclear fuel. You just can't get rid of it. So that's really staining. But some of these natural pigments, like yellow ochre and burnt sienna, I would have expected to lift a bit more easily. Obviously, if you try and lift too much, there's a chance that you will damage the paper. So they seem to be very staining formulations. And again, let, let me just, not because I'm saying one's better than the other, but I'll just for comparison. These were the most recent swatches I did of Michael Harding's. And for example, their lemon yellow, which is PY175, whereas this cadmium yellow is PY35. So they are different, but look how much it lifted compared to say the cadmium lemon so it just shows that you might have a very similar color but different pigments will behave in different ways as I say this is a different paper to that so that's part of the process but understanding what's going on there just well wow, stops you getting too frustrated really I'm not sure I don't think I mentioned this as we were going through there is a warning on here which you won't be able to see <laughs> because it's so teeny tiny and I've even lost where the warning is. Ah, here it is. So there is um, a warning. It says for US only, but I would take it too hard that some of the products in here may cause an allergic reaction. We tend to think of watercolours as very benign, but there can be toxic chemicals in our pigments. If you think about true cadmium it's a heavy metal definitely not good for you or the environment so it is worth just bearing in mind any warnings that are there or general ones like this and thinking about how you dispose of 
your, your rinse water, not letting pets drink your water because cats are notorious for drinking anything but clean water. So just always be aware that watercolours are not necessarily harmless. I'll now go away and do some more experimentation with this and I'll show you the results and come back with some conclusions. So just to prove that I have been using these paints, there they are. And let me show you what I painted. That was just my little swatch to work out uh, colours. And I have been painting a Kingfisher. Really liked that emerald green, the PG7. I added in bright blue that isn't included in this palette, but that I had in a rosa tube because I wanted to get some really gorgeous turquoises for the Kingfisher. And here's one that I did. So it's line and wash. And I did the line work first and then added those washes from the, the pan colours. And this was a second one I did. Same Kingfisher, but just different style of line work. Far more scribble D, and then taking it into the background and sort of making it more stained glass. And I really liked the colours. They, they worked well, they flowed well, they were easy to release from the pan, they mixed beautifully and I had a whole load of fun with them. So if you're looking for a little basic set, I think this has got a lot going for it. The one thing that I'm not convinced about is quite the choice of having that umber and the sepia. Not convinced about that. I might rather have liked to have seen a, something like a dioxazine purple instead. But when you've only got 12 colours, you are going to make decisions and you have to leave something out. As a very portable, small set to take out and about with you, I think that's really nice.